uh, and um, uh, what happens is without philosophy, everyone gets exhausted and you're either going to go behead people or you're going to throw your hands up in the air. You're going to say, well, I guess we'll just agree to disagree. You go into your corner. I'll go into my corner and we'll just do our own thing with the people who believe what we believe. And let's balkanize this shit up uh, the wazoo. And uh, we all retreat to our corners and we claim that moral relativism is the way that uh, things work. Um this this uh those two statements are essentially two completely different things there's the value judgment of uh determining that moral relativism is a good idea and then there's the factual uh assessment that moral relativism is the way things work these are two different things and you can't confuse them like that also as an aside um moral relativism doesn't emerge from a lack of philosophy it can emerge from, you know, very intense philosophical study. And uh, similarly, moral absolutism can emerge from no philosophical study at all. And for the large part, it does. There are a lot of people who believe in moral absolutes simply because they haven't considered um, moral relativism at all. It hasn't even occurred to them, as I'll address later. Um, you, uh, you also imply that uh, cutting people's heads off is solved by philosophy. Um, philosophy isn't Stefan Molyneux's ethics. Uh, philosophy includes a whole range of assessments, the majority of which you probably disagree with, the majority of which I probably disagree with, the majority of which every philosopher, and I'm not a philosopher by the way, but every philosopher in the world disagrees with. Part of philosophy is actually just accepting that we're never going to be able to agree on everything and trying to change people's minds, especially if you believe that you're right and you believe that there is an objective quantifier for what's right in most issues. Um, but always appreciating that you are arguing against the philosophical position. Um, it's sleazy to relegate moral relativism to not being a philosophy. Um, and it's, it's curious that you then don't really engage with it as a philosophy, you engage with it um, almost as a political position. Uh, which says a lot about you, considering you reject the state, and yet you often resort to political talk and avoiding the actual philosophical underpinnings and just looking at the uh, practical statist applications, I'd say, you know, with the state being the organisation that enforces laws and things like that and enforces morality. That's all you're looking at, the enforcement. You're not looking at the philosophical underpinnings. So, I mean, I, look, I mean, if, if, if we're going to do the moral relativist thing as a society, fine, fine. Then what we need to do, of course, is we need to start teaching children moral relativism. We need to start teaching children that there's no such thing as right and wrong. Uh, Stefan Molyneux has a delightful habit of refuting his own arguments. Here, um, one, one of his actual famous or infamous arguments uh, is, is brilliant in a way because it exactly illustrates why all of his other arguments against uh, moral relativism don't work. What he essentially says is um, moral relativism is the conviction that there are no moral values and duties, or no objective values and duties. Um, moral relativists assert that people ought to accept moral relativism and therefore moral relativism is a self-contradiction. That's the shorthand of the argument, I think he makes it a bit longer. But um, well, obviously the issue with that is that moral relativists don't argue that you ought to accept moral relativism. They simply say moral relativism is true and it's up to you whether or not you accept that. But, um, but he makes a good point, which is that moral relativists don't believe in objective moral absolutes. So if a moral relativist were to say we ought to um, do this, then that would make them an idiot. And for someone arguing against moral relativism to argue that moral relativists ought to say that we ought to do this is almost doubly an idiot, because uh, they're, they're twice asserting the notion that moral relativists ought to enforce objective morals. Um, and of course, very simply put, um, no, there is no moral imperative to teach children that there are no moral imperatives.
because there are no moral imperatives. It is that simple. Um, you would have to assume that we ought to teach children every single thing that's true, uh, which I'll address later. But thus far, I, I isolate this one statement um, because it just shows how common this issue is when you're dealing with someone who has outright said at the beginning of a book trying to refute moral relativism that there are no moral imperatives in moral relativism to then repeatedly make appeals to consequence where he presumes moral imperatives in moral relativism. It's just insane. That there are no social rules that they have to obey. That whatever they want to do is perfectly fine and cannot be uh, considered right or wrong or good or bad. Um, this depends in what sense you're using the phrase uh, have to. Um, there are social rules you have to obey or else you will go to prison. Um, or, you know, if you don't want to uh, end up looking like a massive statist uh, because you'll be shot by the private corporations. No, because you will be isolated from society, you know. Um, I don't need to tell my child, I don't have a child, but if I had a child I would need to say, don't do that because, um, because there's a magic concept that says it's bad. You know, I don't, I don't need to explain that notion to my child. Um, but I uh, can say, don't do that, because then no one will like you. You know, if how would you feel about someone if they kept pinching you? You wouldn't want to be their friend, would you? You want friends, so therefore you are, um, you know, not not going to do well in that department if you keep doing things that you don't want to be done to you. Um, moral relativism is simply a matter of finding a uh, common ground, a common moral ground, and the second you have that, then you're fine. So, um, you don't need to teach your child that something is objectively moral and they're wrong and they're false if they disagree with you. You don't need to teach them that, you just say, you ask them what they believe. Say something like, do you think it's okay if, um, one person acts in a really horrible way and then doesn't want to be treated in a horrible way? And most children will say, no, I think that's wrong because you've engaged with them, because you've asked them that question, you've found out the answer. And yes, it is a relative moral assessment. You ask them, do you think this? But most of them will give the answer that you need. And you can almost always find that common ground. And at the end of the day, you might get a total psychopath kid, you know, a moral relativist psychopath who just keeps saying, no, why should I do this? Why should I do that? But um, that's not really a uh, very likely to happen. I will address a bit of an issue with that. Uh, Possibly when I start recording again, I'm not sure. Okay, so it turns out I'm not at the point where I'm going to address uh, what I thought I was going to address, but what I will say, just because I think I kind of didn't quite make this clear, is that things can be considered right or wrong or good or bad, just not objectively so. Uh, very matter-of-factly, I can say to my child, if you do that, I will consider it bad because it contradicts my morals. Um, my child can then say, well, I don't shape morals, which is an unlikely thing for a five-year-old to say. But they can say, I don't shape morals, and I'll get fine. Alright, but that doesn't change the fact that it can be considered bad, and it will be considered bad by the majority of people they meet, if it's heinous enough. So yeah, you don't have to tell children that nothing they do will be considered bad, because that's got nothing to do with moral relativism. Want to study for that test? Study for the test! If you don't want to study the test, well, we're not going to fail you, because that would be a judgement call. <sighs> no, no. Um, there's, there's a difference between doing something, and regarding that thing as objectively moral, for example, um, I will pick up this lighter. That doesn't mean I thought that action was moral, I just did it. Um, and to, to pick, you know, the most relevant example, because this is really worth considering, um, uh, if your job is to fix cars, you go to work and you fix a car. That doesn't mean you think fixing cars is moral, it just means you have to do that as part of your job and as part of the way you contribute to society and this is how it works with teachers. Um, if your job is to mark an exam and follow a criteria to establish whether or not it should be passed, um, then that's your job and you're going to do it because you need to make money and the reason we have that job is because it helps contribute to society by providing um, or teaching children to think critically and to, you know, contribute 
in the same way. Uh, and that's that's about it, really. Uh, that's why what you're saying is stupid. Um, it's not a matter of um, having to believe everything we do is absolutely moral because, you know, this magic concept. And I'm still not really sure what your idea of uh, absolute morals it is. I know universally practical behavior. I've read the book. Still not really sure. Um, but yeah, you don't need to believe that something is objectively moral to follow rules. And I guess the only argument you could make is that maybe the people who make up the criterion uh, are. Um, being incompatible with moral relativism. But again, no, they're not, because, uh, you know, I can say this fact has no moral assessment in it. To be good at maths, you must be able to say what 2 plus 2 is. That's not a moral assessment. That's a simple, you know, we know who people are who are good at maths. We know who people are who are, um, or we know what it takes to be good at maths, we know what those people can do, therefore we can establish uh, what makes people good at maths and establish what it is we ought to be testing. You don't have, you, you want to make up your own spelling? Go for it! There's no such thing as truth and reality and objectivity. Do your own math! Make that shit up! You know, pretend that uh, a silent Bob is shitting out kanji, you know, a tilt a world and call it mathematics. That's fine. Um, you, you must realize that moral relativism isn't the same as absolute um, everything relativism. I'm trying to remember the term for it, the term where nothing is actually true, that's not moral relativism. Moral relativism is distinct from English and maths, and I can't believe you'd suggest that English and maths are the same as morals. Um, in, in writing up some notes on how I was going to respond to this, I think I've essentially written something I can quote verbatim. Uh, the trouble with morality is that morality isn't clearly defined, however, the English language is. Although the English language is partially relative, of course, there are things like, I may find the word bitch more offensive than the word uh, bastard. Um, that, that would be an example of relative, relativity in terms of how we interpret language. Um, it makes sense that certain things are defined objectively and certain things aren't. Um, because language, maths, morality, all simply evaluate certain actions. Maths sees two asteroids floating in space together, then another asteroid comes along, or another two asteroids come along, now there are four asteroids. English sees people moving their mouth to make noise, and to, other, and to the other person, that's a discernible language. Um, I, I use the term English as opposed to linguistics or whatever, um, that's just my Anglocentrism. Um, before there was any actual sense of morality, there were dinosaurs killing each other. However, morality, unlike English and maths, isn't very grounded in the physical dimension because of a concept called moral agency. And moral agency is the idea that really an action is only immoral if the person perpetrating the action has a concept of morality. So most people wouldn't say that the T Rex killing a Brachiosaurus is immoral because the T-Rex doesn't know what it's doing, the T-Rex doesn't really consider morality, and this is an objective fact. You can look at their brain, you can say whether or not they have moral scruples in the way we do, and we, we've determined that lower level organisms do not have morality. And this is why morality is so intricately tied to human society, and this is why morality is distinctly relative, because it is the very same consciousness and value assessment that makes me moral, morally accountable which gives me the ability to determine my own morals. And that's almost the catch-22. The second that um, somebody no longer has the capacity to think of their own morals, they aren't morally accountable. Um, so because moral agency almost comes with moral authority, it creates this weird contradiction where you end up with relativism. Um, that would be the simplest way of understanding relativism, I'd say, although not necessarily an argument for it, but it's, it explains why it is that moral relativism is distinct from English maths logic. You understand those two things are completely contradictory. If we have moral relativism, let's teach the kids that there's no such thing as good and bad and right and wrong. Uh, there are a couple of problems with this argument. Firstly, uh, you don't need to teach kids every single fact about the world. 
Um, I'm sure there are a lot of philosophical positions Steph had Molyneux accepts. Uh, doesn't mean we should sit five-year-old down, five-year-olds down, and teach them every single one. Um, and then the same applies to moral relativism. Incidentally, um, Stefan Molyneux basically throws the system under the bus then. Because whenever anyone uses a, uh, a thought experiment or an appeal to consequence, you always have to consider why they've used the specific example they have. And in this case, Stefan Molyneux used the example of teaching children. Now, why did he use the example of teaching children? Well, there are lots of reasons you could argue, but none of them would really have the effect that I think he was going for. And I think the effect he was going for was arguing that why don't we teach children who can't understand the world, who don't have the same mental faculties as adults, moral relativism? And the answer here is that moral relativism requires intelligence. You have to understand exactly what moral relativism means. Rush you end up saying stupid things like, if we're moral relativists, then we should teach children it. That makes no sense, of course, because moral relativism doesn't say you should do anything. Um, so, you know, basically what he's saying is don't teach children who can't understand the nuances of meta-ethics. Meta-ethics, and there I agree, um, at least to some degree. I think it might be interesting to sit a six-year-old or seven-year-old round down and have kind of that conversation with them. But... Um, it's important to understand that most people start off moral absolutists, because moral absolute, and regardless of what um, this whole thing follows on from a guy who said he was naturally a moral relativist, I think this is false. Most people are naturally moral absolutists. Most people don't think about moral relativism. They just assume, yeah, of course what I believe is right. And I remember the first time I was exposed to the idea of moral relativism. It was in an argument about God, about the moral argument, and it was basically someone said, how could you tell someone, how could you explain to someone that eating other human beings is immoral. And that, at 14 maybe, was when I first even came to terms with the idea that you have to account for your own morality, and that's what moral relativism is. It's accounting for your morality uh, to other people who may not share it. Um, and, uh, and you think, um, you know, as you get older, I think most people find out about moral relativism. They kind of have a bit of a weird moment when you think, is it true? I don't want to believe it's true. You know, I want to believe there's an objective foundation for morality. Um, and then eventually they come to accept, actually, it doesn't really matter because, you know, I understand moral relativism. I understand that most of the arguments against it are bullshit. And I understand that whether or not I like it, it's true. Um, so, yeah, I do agree. Don't tell five-year-olds uh, this complicated fact that's you know, much less simple than simply saying this is good and this is bad and this is why because I said so. Don't do that, that's bad. So well done, Steph, I couldn't have put it matter myself that moral relativism has more intellectual rigour than your um, pontifications. So how the right. hell do we have a society where adult to adult is nothing but moral relativism uh, definitely, the majority of people in the world are not moral relativists, simply the number of religious people in the world who accept divine, divine command theory um, accounts for you know, the majority of the adult population, not moral relativists. So you've got the religious people, and you've got people who haven't considered philosophy and just go through the natural state of assuming that what they believe is right without really thinking about it, which I, I don't know how much that is, I'm not going to guess. But then you've got the minority of adults who, um, who, uh, I think, think actually, maybe there's something more complicated about how we determine what's moral, uh, and it's not just things being right or wrong, it's about sociology and things like that. Um, to put it into perspective, um, I've had a couple of moments where I've been asked about university and books I'm reading and things like that by, uh, both my grandparents and my parents um, had to explain it. Every single one of them had to explain the concept of moral relativism. Six adults. All, all like, and not even, you know, I didn't have to search around for them, just the six adults directly in my lineage. Um, each one didn't even think about moral relativism, never occurred to them. So how, how I mean, you know, that's not supposed to be an anecdotal evidence, I'm just saying I'm pretty sure this is the case for a lot of people. Uh, they don't really know very many people, and they're all atheists, by the way. All of um, my grandparents and 
my parents all moral absolutists because they haven't thought about it. And now they have, and now they're all moral relativists. And no, they haven't all killed each other. And let's never hit them because that would be imposing your values on someone else. Mm, staff, staff, staff. Uh, again, no, there's no moral imperatives and moral relatives. And as you've said before yourself, but completely disregard when it's convenient. No, there are no moral imperatives in moral relativism. Um, you can hit kids. It's not objectively immoral to hit kids. It's also not objectively immoral. I just want to put this in perspective. There is no reason why I cannot enforce my morals in a moral relativist system, because there's no reason why I cannot do anything from a moral perspective. I could kill every single person who didn't think Mondays were more moral than Tuesdays, no matter how um, thin or unimportant the moral difference is. I can enforce it, and I wouldn't be contradicting the idea that um, that there are no morals or no objective morals. This is really basic stuff, and it's it's one of those things that's just intuitive, and you think you can't miss the point this often. Um, and I I do think, for the most part, you're dishonest on the subject. You you're not stupid, which I don't know. You can take that as a compliment if you like. Um, you know, um, I always say this, people say, oh, if, if you're a moral relativist, then what do you plan to do on the, about the Taliban? And I say, shoot them. Send soldiers there, shoot the Taliban dead, because I disagree with them. And because lots of people I know disagree with them. And because the people who disagree with them have more power, they have more... Um, the people who disagree with the values the Taliban have, have the capacity to destroy the Taliban. Now, this is because of the advances that certain values bring about over others and in reality historically we do see um if you accept things like uh and i think stefan monning does accept this except things like uh the ending of slavery the ending of uh feudalism the ending of a lot of dictatorships in europe as if you accept these as good things then you have to accept that historically the principle that certain groups will simply enforce their morals on everyone, regardless of whether or not they're objected. It has worked quite well. You know, I would rather, I think everyone would consider us to be living in a more moral society now than we ever have, apart from idiots. Um, I don't know what you're going to say. How can you call them idiots? I just disagree with you morally. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, but, you know, you don't need to let everyone just live. You can throw people in prison. You can shoot people in the head for uh, laughing at a joke you don't find funny, because that's moral relative. It's moral relative than the conviction you should let everything slide. Now, of course, most people don't believe you should shoot people in the head for laughing at jokes they find funny, but I'm bringing this up just to show you that the idea that moral relativism means you cannot, um, you know, aggress against people who disagree with you is false. Moral relativism isn't absolute liberalism or permission to do anything. It can be the permission to be the most totalitarian person in the world. It's not an ethical, a normative ethical position. It's a meta-ethical position. So it's not directly saying you should or shouldn't do anything. And I would argue that those two things are exactly the same. One is a direct cause of the other. You make an interesting point amidst the old repetitive bullshit, you know, he says, I'm not going to show you the whole clip, but he says a lot of stuff about, or you say a lot of stuff, I'm not sure if I'm responding to you. You've actually responded to a comment, a comment I left on this video, so I don't know if you'll watch this, you probably won't, but you left a, uh, you, you repeat a lot of the stuff about um, how moral relativists think it's moral to be moral relativists. Again, contradiction, not clever. Um, but you do make an interesting point. You make the point that maybe the reason why people enforce their morality on their children is because they believe there are no moral values themselves. Or at least that's the point. I think you, you kind of make two points at once. And that's interesting because that's the point I made in the very last um, bit of the video I, I made um, where I pointed out actually you can be a moral relativist and still say that it's absolutely moral to enforce your morals on others. Um, 
and an example I'll make later on uh, because I've kind of recorded this in the word order which is that you can be absolutely averse to the idea that there's moral good and yet still act morally good um, in the way you believe to be morally good in a way that directly affects others um, the other point you try to make is that people are cowards and you basically say people won't enforce their morality on their children because, oh sorry, people will enforce their morality on their children because children are weak but they won't enforce morality on each other. Again, this is obviously false because, um, you know, people shoot each other, people shoot full-grown adults over morals, people vote for policies that affect full-grown adults. Um, I'm not sure if you're saying that people should hit other adults to enforce their morality and that would make it consistent. Um, but the funny thing is, as I see it, you're basically arguing for the teaching of children moral relativism, which is, I do think, probably a good idea at least when they're six or seven. I remember the argument you made now, it was an argument that um, that the reason why children can't reason with each other when they become adults is because um, they were abused as children and they were told these very strict moral laws when they were children and then had them beaten into them. Which seems like a really good argument for moral relativism. I think if we did raise children as moral relativists then they would work out pretty great. If we did do the example I was talking about earlier, where we say to a child, why do you think this? Why is this moral? And you entertained with all these questions about why is this moral? Why is this moral? And you got them to actually see it from a, a personal point rather than teaching them the ideas of morals and manners and things like that as if they are actually objective is a good idea. So again, you seem to be arguing for a uh, position that contradicts your own. You seem to be arguing that we should actually teach children the reality of moral relativism so that they can better account for it. And I think that's a good point. Moral relativism is a problem if you aren't prepared for it, if you run around saying things like, oh, no, I can kill everyone, which of course you can't because of obvious social issues. Um, so really, again, agreement entirely. Uh, good job. Moral relativism. Well, if moral relativism is true, we are abusing our children by hitting them and commanding them to obey certain ethical standards. If moral relativism is true, then the entire court system, the entire judiciary and punishment system is evil. <laughs> um, you, you just said that if moral relativism is true, then the court system is evil. Um, you, mm. you, that's not clever. You, you realize what you you just said. You, you just said if there are no absolute moral values or objective moral values, then um, then something is objectively morally wrong. You've evaluated something as objectively morally wrong according to a system where there are objectively no moral values. And, hmm. If moral relativism is false. If moral relativism is false, then people who will not impose their values on others, though they are more than willing to beat them into their kids, are a goddamn bunch of cowards. I'm not putting you in that category. I'm just telling you the general approach that uh, bothers me. So what about the millions and millions of people who accept moral relativism but also believe that we should enforce our moral, uh, moral values on others? What about them? You know, the, the majority of people who exist as opposed to the zero people who believe we should never, ever, ever enforce our morality on others. Um, because I'm curious about that. Um, and, and what about, you know, and not everyone is, is abusive to their children, and there are a lot of people, you know, what about the, uh, I don't want to say the soldier necessarily, but maybe the humanitarian aid worker who spits in the face of the, Tal the, the Taliban doctrine that women shouldn't be allowed to be educated, uh, educated. And then he goes home to his kids and he's like, oh no, no, please accept your own ideas. Uh, and he encourages them to think for themselves. That guy could be a moral relativist. You realize that, don't you? You don't know anything about that guy. The, the humanitarian who is constantly trying to impose what he sees to be right whether through violence or whether through acting positively in the lives of others, is not necessarily, you know nothing about what he thinks of the matter ethics from that. 
you just have to accept that we're not really lying to our children. I wish everybody could argue like that. It would be very convenient if you could um, argue a point by saying you just have to, and then just positing another undefended point. Um, to accept that God exists, you just have to accept that the Bible isn't lying. To accept that God exists, you just have to accept that 99% of people in human history haven't been wrong. You have to accept that 99% of human people, uh, people in human history haven't been lying to their children. Um, your argument is entirely that people act as if moral, objective moral values exist and therefore objective moral values do exist. Bad argument. Um, not not a good argument. There's there's a worse of all. There are better arguments in the same vein. Um, you, I, I imagine, haven't made any of them. There's the uh, I think I think the broccoli thought experiment. Um, I'm not going to explain that, but there are better arguments that, um, for objective morals. You've never touched on any of them. Um, so yeah, we are lying to our children. If we tell our children, and we don't tell our children this, by the way, ever, but if we were to tell our children there's an objective standard, and it's this magical thing that just transcends all of, it has nothing to do with moral agency or conscious beings, it's just there, then we're lying to them. And I can't accept that we're not lying to them if we tell them that, because it's a falsehood, and they deserve the truth, at least at the point when they're capable of understanding it. And a moral standard that is appropriate for a three-year-old, I think without a huge amount of extrapolation, can be fairly valid for a 30-year-old as well.